Good evening, Chicago. It's Friday night. Jimmy, hope everybody's doing well. Before I head out for tonight, I'm going to do a follow-up, a part two of a story I did a few weeks ago. We're going to talk about one of the most interesting, powerful, richest man in the Chicago outfit, this gentleman here, John DeFranzo. John DeFranzo was born in Italy, December 13, 1928. Eventually became a made member of the Chicago outfit. And he had two nicknames. My favorite nickname is what Joey Lombardo used to call him, Bananas, Johnny Bananas. But his most common nickname that everybody knows him by is No-Nos. There's two stories how he got that nickname. One, he was burglarizing a high-end store on Michigan Avenue. And he smashed through a showcase, slicing off a piece of his nose. Or the second story, my favorite, he actually got in a shootout with the cops, and they shot off his nose. You can see the young John DeFranzo here, mugshot, and a piece of his nose is missing. Um, but he was a member of the three-minute game. That consisted of himself, Chris Carty, and Big Al Sarno. DeFranzo was also a suspect in the 1952 murder of a West Side politician. DeFranzo did two stints in prison, one for burglary and one for racketeering. When his superiors and his ops went to prison, men like Jimmy Marcello, boss Sam Carlisi, overall boss Joey Upa, when they went to prison, John DeFranzo became boss of the Chicago outfit from the mid-1990s to the late 2000s. And he had a different style of leadership. Rather than lead through fear and violence, like Angela the Bull of the 26th Street crew, Jimmy Marcello, Ayupa, and Felice. DeFranza was smart. He instructed everyone in his crew that there was no longer, they would no longer use violence. There's other ways to collect money. Also, DeFranzo made a lot of money in the rackets over the years but made even more money legitimately. As he got older, he realized he didn't need the money from the rackets because he was making so much money legitimately. Now, I never met the DeFranzos. I've never even seen them out and about, but I certainly have friends that knew some of the DeFranzos brothers, and they said that John treated people well. He hooked up all of his family members, friends, and associates, all the people that were close to him. He hooked them up with city jobs. He got them jobs in the state, jobs in the Cook County Sheriff's Department, Chicago Police Department, even at some of the suburban municipalities. DeFranzo made a fortune in the construction business alone, as well as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and the Chicago Board of Trade. Now here's DeFranzo's right-hand man, his brother, Peter DeFranzo. His nickname was Greedy Pete, made member of the Chicago outfit, did a stint in Leavenworth for burglary, never once ratted or cooperated Stand-up guy, loyal guy. And once Marco D'Amico went to prison, it was Pete DeFranzo that took over as boss of the Elmwood Park crew. And like his brother John, this guy made millions of dollars in the rackets and made even more money in the construction business. You could find him hanging out back then at Gene's Deli, the Luna Cafe, 
But most of the time, he was at his office, DMP Construction. You could drive by there, and it's a big, huge yard. I have a funny story, though. Years ago, we uh, we did some work at some of these high-end nursing homes. And as we were setting up, the boss of the crew, he said, man, this place smells like Pete DeFranzo's money. <laughs> I thought that was pretty pretty funny. But Pete DeFranzo, uh, he passed away in 2020 of COVID. God bless him. His older brother, John DeFranzo, who passed away in 2018. Both of them lived to be in their 80s. And Pete DeFranzo, like his brother John, more than John, he kept a low profile. He didn't really get indicted. He dodged a lot of the uh, major uh, outfit trials. He was never a uh, part of any of those RICO cases. Some people think he was under the protection of his brother. Some people think that because of his brother's cooperating that part of his cooperation was to protect his brother, Pete DeFranzo. But we'll never know. But we know one thing. He was definitely a heavyweight for the Chicago outfit. Now, here's his younger brother, Joe DeFranzo. Definitely an associate of the Chicago outfit. I'm not sure if he's a made man or not. Uh, but he got pinched operating a million-dollar-a-year indoor uh, marijuana growing operation that brought out a lot of heat, got the media's attention. It also got some of the bosses of the outfit's attention. Sam Carlisi was livid when he found out that they were growing large amounts of marijuana. Seven to 15 guys got indicted. They all pled out. I think they got like maybe 10 years each. But he lambed it, and some people think that his brother, John DeFranzo, was protecting him down in Florida, protecting him from the feds, and protecting him from the outfit. He eventually turned himself in, and for some reason, he ended up getting a reduction in his sentence. But this guy here, he's alive and well, active. Um... Two of his older brothers who were more heavyweights who passed away. But this is uh, Joe DeFranzo. And how it started was one of his juice customers got behind on a loan. And the DeFranzo brothers were, weren't using violence anymore. Like I said earlier, there were other ways to collect money. So he told the guy he could pay off the loan. If he allows large amounts of marijuana to be grown at his beautiful 15-room home in Inverness, the guy agreed. He started growing marijuana to squash the loan. Inverness is a very wealthy suburb of Chicago on the northwest side, and that's where Rocky and Felice used to live. Uh, but all the defendants were found guilty. Um, now the government took over, and now... Marijuana is legal in Illinois. Now, John DeFranzo, no surprise, he liked the wine and dine. And in Chicago, you know, we're surrounded by some of the best restaurants in the country. Here's John DeFranzo, Marco D'Amico, and a couple of good fellas with uh, the Greek owner, Alex Dana. Alex Dana is definitely a mob associate. And DeFranzo um, invested in some of Alex Dana's restaurants some of the best Italian restaurants in Chicago. But this was the uh, the the original, the best rosebud in the city right there in Taylor and Laughlin. Now, unfortunately, it's closed. But now it's more of a speakeasy. They open it up for private events. And usually they'll have outdoor seating during the uh, Taylor Street Festival. And at the Taylor Street Festival, you always see uh, outfit guys, family, friends, and associates. Uh, I usually see Sally D there. Enjoy a nice dinner outside, smoking a cigar. Chrissy Spina usually goes to the Taylor Street Fest. I've seen uh, Gabit there one time, Bobby Bellavia, as well as, um, what's his face, um, Neff, Michael Tallarico, and some of the Taylor Street guys. But this is just one of many of the uh, places that John DeFranzo used to hang out at. 
now here we go. This is like the uh, playground for wise guys back in the day. You got Russian Division. We used to hang out at Mother's, P.S. Chicago, Eddie Rockets, Jilly's, Faces. And it seemed like every weekend there was a fight. A lot of the Wild Bunch guys used to go down here and raise hell. Butch Petroselli, Tony Borsellino. Um, but John DeFranzo um, helped a lot of these guys with startup money. So most of your um, high-end restaurants and bars and nightclubs on Rush Street, especially back in the day, um, were all mobbed up. Now, unfortunately, most of these landmark bars and restaurants have all closed, and now it's just a bunch of uh, people walking their dogs, cafes, high-end shops, and more glass tower condominiums. But uh, make no mistake, the Chicago Outfit, John DeFranzo, uh, Caesar DeVarco, Vince Solano, many others had their hooks in a lot of the gambling and real estate right there, right there in the Gold Coast. Now here, right here in Melrose Park, believe it or not, DeFranzo also had concessions where he sold concessions, contracts to Kitty Land and also the horse track, horse race track right next door, right there on North and First Avenue. I remember this place as a, as a kid. We used to go here all the time. There was also a roller rink not too far away. Um, but John DeFranzo had, who knows, probably a couple hundred thousand dollars he was making with concessions alone at the horse track where all the wise guys used to hang out in Kitty Land. Fast forward, I went to Vito Scavo's trial. Vito was the chief of uh, police, chief of Melrose Park Police. He was appointed that position by none other than Joey Ayupa. And Vito Scavo, Gary Montino, and other brass Melrose Park police guys were operating their own security company on police time. And they actually were extorting a lot of commercial industrial businesses up and down 25th Avenue. And Kitty Land was actually one of the companies that they, they extorted. Now, Vito's trial never really got a lot of attention because it was going on the exact same time as Governor Blagojevich's trial. So I was actually had two trials going on at the exact same time. I would watch Blago's trial on the 25th floor, get a little bored, then go down to the 15th floor and sit in on the Vito Scavo trial. All the cops in Melrose Park were found guilty. None of them informed. None of them flipped. They uh, spent a couple of years in prison, in jail, and now they're all home. I know Vito got back into the restaurants, restaurant business, uh, Danny G's, or I'm sorry, Danny Deli in Melrose Park, on um, Danny G, Donny G's in uh, Elmwood Park, but two of the best Italian restaurants in the city. It's one thing about Vito Scavo. He knows how to run a good restaurant. But Kitty Land is just one of several uh, legitimate businesses that the outfit had a piece in. Another um, legitimate company that DeFranzo made a fortune on right here was this huge company, trucking company in Hodgkins right there off of uh, I-55 in Mannheim Road, uh, Consol Consolidated Freight. Uh, DeFranzo and his partners, I'm forgetting their names, made millions of dollars in the trucking business years ago. And I remember a lot of uh, family, friends, and neighbors used to work for this company. Now this here, the car dealership, this was uh, John DeFranzo's passion. His goal, his dream was to be the largest car dealership in the Midwest. And he almost made it. If it wasn't for his responsibilities as boss of Chicago Outfit, he probably would have went 100% legit because he made a fortune in buying and selling cars. And I've never bought a car from RZA, but most of my family members and friends all bought cars from RZA. I heard the service was the worst. But what are you going to do, argue with a guy like John DeFranzo or Joe RZA? <laughs> Another uh, cash cow for DeFran DeFranzo and his partners, he invested in the Hip Mall which is right there on uh, Harlem and Irving Park, not too far from mobbed-up neighborhood Elmwood Park. Um, this is close to Rolling Stones Records, not too far from I-90 and Harlem, maybe 30 minutes from downtown Chicago. But imagine owning a commercial building, a mall, if you will, and you got all these prominent stores like Carson, Best Buy, and Target that paid monthly rent to you. 
This is a cash cow for DeFranzo back then, and it's still thriving today. This is the hip mall. And then this is Pete DeFranzo's company that's in his wife's name, DNP Construction. And I mean, you guys know me, I'm all over the place. The vast majority of residential, commercial, uh, construction sites that I drive by in the city and the surrounding suburbs, 90% of them all have a DNP dumpster parked outside. They have their yard right there in Melrose Park. But this, this company here is worth millions, DNP construction. Now, we're going to talk about these guys here, the Spalatro brothers. When Mikey Marcello would visit Jimmy Marcello in prison, they would talk in code, specifically about the upcoming Family Secrets trial. They would refer to the Splatros as the Chivagos. And Mikey was telling his brother Jimmy Marcello, as he brushed his finger across his nose, that this guy was not in the indictment, meaning that John DeFranzo was not in the Family Secrets indictment. And Jimmy Marcello knew that John DeFranzo took part in the brutal beatdown of Splatter Brothers, and he wanted to know why. That's when he either started thinking that John DeFranzo was an informant, cooperating, dry snitching, whatever you want to call it, or that confirmed his suspicions all the time when Jimmy Marcello got pinched during the Sam Carlisi trial in the early 1990s. Sam Carlisi's entire crew was sent to jail. John No Knows DeFranzo took over, and he had nobody in his way. According to Nick Calabrese, it was little Jimmy Marcello that set up the Spalatro brothers because they trusted Jimmy. They were good friends with their families. Nick Calabrese testified that when Michael walked down the stairs, he was greeted with a handshake and a smile by Nick. Then he dove for his ankles while Louis the Mooch, Louis Eboli, strangled Michael with a rope. Michael went quietly, didn't put, put up much of a fight. Nick went on to say that a small 22 caliber gun fell out of Michael's pants, and he said that John DeFranzo picked the gun up off the floor, unloaded it, and then wipe the smudge of blood off the wall. According to Nick Calabrese, the government's star witness, made member of the Chicago outfit, who went into great detail, he testified that John Nono's the Franzo, Sam Carlisi, Joe Ferriola, Rocky and Felice, Louis Tomatoes, Al Taco, and others personally beat and stomped Tony Spilatro to death. But for some reason, John No Knows DeFranzo was never charged in the Family Secrets trial or the Family Secrets 2, which there never was a Family Secrets 2 trial. I don't think they had enough to corroborate what Nick said, placing no-nos at that house in Bensonville. Otherwise, they would have charged them because they swabbed all the Chicago Alpha guys and associates, and no-nos the Franzo was one of the guys they swabbed, trying to see if they can get any DNA linking him to the murders. What do you guys think? Why wasn't John DeFranzo charged in the Spalatro brothers' murders? Very good friend, very close associate, Another main member of uh, John DeFranzo's Elmwood Park crew, you had Marco the Mover D'Amico. Uh, I always felt sorry for this guy because he got sent to prison based on that lowlife, crooked cop, corrupt lawyer, cokehead, degenerate gambler Bob Cooley. Bob Cooley got sick and tired of being abused by the outfit guys. He owed John Nono's DeFranzo $400,000. He owed John Fecarata money. He owed Butchie money. He got a little behind in his taxes. And rather than do a couple years in jail and pay off his debts, 
he decided to flip and cooperate against all his good friends. He actually wore a wire. But it was his testimony that sent Marco D'Amico to prison, as well as Harry Alleman, Alderman Rohde, and others. Bob Cooley's testimony crippled the first ward. And when that happened, they lost all their political power. But I bring him up because he's good friends with John Nonos DeFranzo, a trusted ally. Another good friend, you got Donald Stevens, one of the most corrupt mayors in Chicago. He always denied knowing any outfit guys, but as we all know, they had him under surveillance having lunch with John Nonos DeFranzo, Joey, Lomb Joey, Lomb Joey Lombardo, uh, Joey Andrieca, Joey the Builder, and several others. If you ever drive drive through the town of Rosemont, I mean, they've got the Allstate Arena, the Rosemont Theater, a high-end mall, uh, steakhouses, high-end restaurant bars, an ice rink. Um, they were even going to put a casino there, but because of the mob ties, they wouldn't allow it. So they built the Casino Rivers and the town right, right next door um, in Des Plaines. Rosemount was very important to No Nose Franzo and Joe Lombardo and the Alpha because it borders O'Hare. So if they can control Rosemont, they can tr control a lot of the jobs and sweetheart contracts going in and out of O'Hare, not counting everything that they hijack. So that's a cash cow for the Chicago outfit was the town of Rosemont and obviously all the sweetheart contracts that went on at O'Hare. Another good friend, I mean, John DeFranzo had lots of friends, and one of them was Mr. Beef, uh, the late Joe Zaccaro, a dear friend of mine, and there's his son, Chrissy, and unfortunately, Mr. Beef passed away, but if you're ever in the River North area, you definitely want to go here. This is one of the best Italian beef sandwiches in the city. There's plenty of parking. They've got a nice little dining area, and you can see photos of all the famous people, but I used to love to... Uh, uh, bullshit with Joey he used to tell me stories of his nights out on Rush Street with all the guys, all the wise guys. And anytime guys like uh, Chaz, Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, Jay Leno were in town, Joe always took them out to dinner. But he didn't take them to any tourist restaurant. He took them to small mom pa places like uh, in uh, Pilsen or Taylor Street, like Tefano's or small little dive places in Elmwood Park. But one night, one time he told me he was out with his buddies uh, and they were gambling and they lost big. So they reached out to John DeFranzo late at night. They met John in Elmwood Park and no questions asked. DeFranzo gave these guys a couple hundred thousand, a couple thousand dollars. They went back, gambled more, but this time they won big. The next morning when they met John DeFranzo to pay back the money. They gave him a little bit more money, like interest, like a little bit of a tip. But DeFranzo wouldn't accept a dime more. But that shows what kind of guy that John DeFranzo was, how generous he was, and what a good friend he was. But this is the late Joe Zaccaro, Mr. Beef. God bless Joe Zaccaro. And now his son, Chrissy, uh, runs the joint. Now, last but not least, we got to talk about Sam Carlisi. Um, underboss to Joey Ayupa. He was his personal driver. When Iupa went to the can during the Strawman case, it was Sam Carlisi that took over as boss of Chicago Outfit. Joe Ferriola, another top leader, passed away as well. Now, some sources will tell you that Carlisi was more like Joe Iupa. He believed in violence. Anybody that broke a rule, got out of line, disrespected him, or he even thought that they were going to go to the grand jury or, or snitch. They weren't taking any chances. They would have him killed. Where John DeFranzo, his leadership was, let's stop using violence. It creates too much heat. There's other ways to conduct business. Let's get out of the rackets and go more legit. So Carlisi started doing some serious things like ordering hits, bombings, without consulting with his underboss. So this went on for a while, making no-nos pretty uneasy around Carlisi. And then when Carlisi had Dominic Sinise, an attempted botched explosion, I'll never forget, I actually seen that car surrounded by 
uh, police tape over there in the Taylor Street area. Dominic Sinise survived. But Carlisi was trying to have him killed. And when that happened, John DeFranzo not only no longer trusted his boss, Sam Carlisi, but now he started to think that Carlisi would eventually kill him. Now, some people also think that John DeFranzo met secretly with some of the agents and gave them information on its ops, information on Sam Carlisi, maybe Rocky and Feliz, maybe Jimmy Marcello. Come early 1990s, the Sam Carlisi trial, the second trial I went to, that was a major blow to the Chicago Alpha. You had Sam Carlisi, boss of Chicago Alpha, his right-hand man, Jimmy Marcello, little Tony Zizzo, made member, Anthony the Hatch, made member, a couple of All those guys were found guilty and went to prison. John Nonos DeFranzo was not part of that indictment. He became boss. He had all the power. He was making all the money. And there was nobody, his ops weren't there. He also, John DeFranzo, tried to reach out to Jimmy Marcello because he was Carlisi's right-hand man. He was his underboss. You see, when Jack Cerrone was boss, he would refer to and consult with DeFranzo as underboss, especially on hits or big-time decisions. So DeFranzo expected the same respect from Sam Carlisi, but Carlisi wasn't wired that way. So DeFranzo was trying to talk to Jimmy Marcello to see if he could get Sam Carlisi to reduce some of the violence and change some of his ways. But Jimmy Marcello just toyed with DeFranzo, making him believe that he was going along with John. But in reality... He was loyal to Sam Carlisi. And sure enough, when he got when he came home from the first uh, pinch he did with the Carlisi crew, he was only home a couple months. The feds knock on his door and they indicted him for the Splatro brothers' murders in the family secrets trial. Little Jimmy Marcello is one of the last Mohicans locked up in a supermax prison in ADX, Colorado. There's no reason this man needs to be locked up in ADX Supermax. He uh, did his time. He's no longer a threat. I'm pretty sure his Chicago outfit days are over. It's time for this man to come home to his family. But in the end, we all know John Nolan knows DeFranzo avoided prison time kept most of the millions that he made, lived to be in his 80s, dodged several indictments, why some of his ops ended up in prison. And also, <coughs> the people close to him didn't go to jail, kept their businesses, and were somewhat protected if indeed he was dry snitching. But I want to know, what do you guys think? Do you guys think that DeFranzo was a, a double agent? Dry snitching at the same time as running the Chicago outfit? I'm not so sure. But thanks for watching. If you like my Chicago Mob Trial stories, please hit the like button, subscribe, share with your friends. I want to share one more thing with you. John DeFranzo to the Loon Cafe. The 80-year-old convicted mob boss has driven his shiny new pickup truck a few blocks from the Grand Avenue home where he's lived for years. He is the first one here for lunch with no nose. Mr. DeFranzo has been there in there on a regular basis. Uh, the earlier stories were that he was in there like clockwork every Tuesday night. That was his local watering hole, just like a lot of guys in Chicago have their local watering hole. Uh, Rumor has it that he's in there a bit more frequently nowadays. From the old days, his nose has long since been recast, and now he is much more likely to be called Johnny Bananas to his face. His brother Peter shows up next, the owner of a suburban waste hauling firm.
firm. Peter DeFranzo is a convicted warehouse thief who did time at Leavenworth. Mob investigators say, like his brother, Peter is a fully initiated made member of the Chicago outfit and believed to be his brother's most trusted lieutenant and advisor. Then comes Marco the murderer D'Amico, a one-time bricklayer and a Franzo protege. D'Amico is a convicted mob capo with a 50-year criminal history of gambling, racketeering, and tough guy intimidation. Marco at one time was running the Elmwood Park Street crew. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, they found him a, um, a higher stature position if one was available right after he got out. Next to arrive, another DeFranzo brother, Joe, a former juice loan boss, once convicted of running the nation's largest indoor marijuana farm. Other DeFranzo chums walk in until the table for nine is full for what could be a command performance. Anybody in the outfit will go when they're called. It's a very hierarchical organization. A lot of these guys uh, would uh, spit in the face of the devil walking through the doors of hell. For decades, the Chicago mob has been conducting business at restaurant dining tables. This is the most famous photo in outfit history, snapped in 1976 and later found by the FBI during a raid. Except for Joey the Clown Lombardo, who was just sentenced to life in prison, the crime syndicate leaders seen here are all dead. But now there is a new family photo <coughs> taken by the I-Team just last Friday, as John no Nose DeFranzo, standing there on the left, dishes out pizza to the outfit's upper crust. Hey John. How you doing, buddy? After the two-hour pizza and wine meeting, DeFranzo was first to leave. What's going uh, on? How was the meeting? What meeting? Uh, pizza lunch. Pizza? Oh, yeah, that was good. It was good. Yeah, you, you come looking, here a lot? You're looking to, no, just first time. Mr. Yeah. D'Amico in there? I have. I don't even know who he is. Oh, I thought I saw him go into your, uh, to your luncheon. No, I haven't seen him. No, he hasn't been around. DeFranzo was not charged during the landmark family secrets trial in 2007 that took down major mob bosses and solved more than a dozen gangland murders. But key witness and hitman Nick Calabrese testified that DeFranzo had a hand in the grisly 1986 murders of Las Vegas mob boss Anthony Spilatro and his brother Michael. During a sentencing hearing last month, Park Ridge dentist Dr. Pat Spilatro challenged the government to arrest DeFranzo for his part in killing the brothers. Pat Spilatro said he, he wanted to know why the government hadn't picked you up yeah. in connection with family secrets. I, not a, I don't know anything about it. Sorry. Yeah. From the federal government's point of view, um, the jury believed Nick Calabrese. They believed everything Nick said. They got the convictions on virtually everybody. One of the things Nick Calabrese said was among the guys that were beating on the Spilatro brothers was John DeFranzo. He's the only one left alive out of the group that was identified by Nick Calabrese that hasn't been indicted and tried. Are you concerned that, uh, that, no, that no, you may I'm end up in uh, family no. secrets too? No, I'm not concerned at all. Bye. Nice talking to you. Watch breaking news on YouTube. Subscribe to... <laughs> What do you guys think? You think it was a double agent? Think it was dry snitching while running the Chicago outfit? That's that's a bit of a stretch. But we'll never know. If you like my Chicago mob trials, please hit the like button, subscribe, share with your friends. Everybody be safe. John DeFranzo passed away in his late 80s in 2018. God bless John DeFranzo. Take care, everybody.